prova, ok. Sul microfono traduttrici. Prova, prova. Test, test. Test, test. Prova. Uno, due, tre. Prova, prova. Test, test. Sì, uno, due, prova. Eh, chiaro. Test. Test, 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 uno, due.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Welcome to the Locarno Turks La Mobiliare. And I especially like to welcome our two guests, our two talk guests, Barbara Treutlein and Daniel Müller, and also, of course, the moderator, Ralf Stutzke. Yeah. It's great to be here, and um, I'm very pleased that so many of my colleagues are also with us today. And um, my name is Dorothee Strauss. I am responsible for the societal commitment at La Mobiliare in the field of innovation and the field of sustainability and art. And we are um, main partner at the Locarno Film Festival since 2017. And especially this commitment particularly this commitment is one of our engagements which is really very close to our hearts. And this is because we believe that art, culture, and of course science are important drivers for future development. And this is exactly the reason that um, we have created together with the Locarno Film Festival, two new platforms, the Locarno Garden, La Mobiliare, and of course, the great Locarno Talks, La Mobiliare. Um, to say a few words about our engagement, um, La Mobiliare has been anchored in a cooperative since more than 190 years. And that means that the topic togetherness is really important for us. We want to create, we want to establish new platforms where people can share their knowledge, can share experience, new ideas, and be inspired for the idea how to shape the future in a good direction, in a good way. And this is why we are here, isn't it? Huh? So um, I'm looking forward to the great conversation. I can't wait. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. And it's great to stay here together with Stefano Knuchel, my wonderful colleague. He will tell you now a bit more about our concept, about our ideas behind. And yeah, enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothea. It's always fun and challenging to put together the idea of the Locarno Talks because it's really unexpected how we come up with the program. It's not a determined process where you have specific areas or specific personality you would invite. Every time we have to reinvent around keywords. And of course, one central element is that element that now is the best place to change the future, which is how you're changing the future now. Sometimes it might seem a little bit more abstract, but the concept today can be more concrete than today because these persons are really changing the future every day. What might seem a little bit more abstract is maybe the relation with the key word of this year, which is emotions, or which is why do we speak about science in the cinema world? Well, actually, I was joking with the professor yesterday. I, I, I can only joke with them because speaking seriously, I'm not up to the task. But so <laughs> I was saying, you know, once science fiction used to run ahead of science, it feels like now science is running ahead of cinema, of every kind of invention. So if one wants to come up with a science fiction story, you have to check very seriously, is this happening? Is, is it already there and I don't know it? So it's, it's really fascinating and scary and what they touch upon can change really the meaning of life, the meaning of society, the meaning of gender, life and death. If we touch all this and that's what they touch, all our storytelling are to be redefined. So probably there are some books that you have been had there for 100 years and they will belong to a very long past, a, a, a way, another kind of, uh, of humankind. And I think we are approaching that point and talking with them, uh, the opportunity, opportunity I had to talk uh, with professors uh, during these weeks before the talk was really precious. And I really hope that in this hour of meeting, you get the chance to share this emotion, this insight into 
a future and what it could mean also for our identity, not only for our body, but also for our identity. So thank you very much for coming, and I give it up to my dear Ralph Stutzky. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we would like to thank um, particularly Stefano Knuchel and Lili Insten from the uh, Locarno Film Festival, and also uh, Dorothea Strauss and La Mobiliare for having us here. Um, this is going to be a very exciting subject we are going to discuss with you, engineering life. What happened to the good old days when we just engineered cars? You know, times have changed and they're changing fast. And here are two people uh, that are part of this process. And Stefano gave us an idea that sometimes uh, it seems like uh, very easy to, we feel uh, intimidated when, you, when we talk as non-scientists uh, about uh, these issues. But uh, we want to show the contrary is truth with this talk. So we would kindly ask you and invite you to, to join into the discussion, to, to give us your questions. And do not feel, free, uh, do, do not feel unsecure or scared. Uh, thinking that you might not have the right terminology or, or so. We all feel the same way every once in a while. So don't worry. And this talk is uh, uh, basically about you, your concerns, your questions, your constructive input. This is why we're here, uh, here today. Now we're going to discuss this subject, uh, engineering life, within a scientific framework or a frame which is called NCCR MSE in short. We're going to show a uh, logo of this, uh, this framework, this national project. NCCR MSE stands for, now get this, National Center of Competence in Research Molecular Systems Engineering. <laughs> so this is our way of making sure that nobody wants to talk to us about it. <laughs> um, this national research project has been around for five years and the reason why I'm saying this is all three of us are involved in this NCCR molecular systems engineering. Me being the ethicist of this project. And I'm only saying this to make sure that you know I might be biased this morning with my questions. And if I am, don't let me get away with it, <laughs> okay? So I would like to start uh, with um, my guests, of course, Barbara Treutlein and, um, and uh, Daniel Müller, but uh, particularly with Daniel Müller right now, who is a professor of biophysics at ETH Zürich, ETH Zürich, uh, DBSSE, which is another very lovely abbrevi uh, abbreviation, Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering. And he's also co-director of the MSENCCR. <laughs> yeah. Um, quite an uh, interesting business card that he has, I guess. Daniel, give us a brief overview of, of, of why you are involved um, in this NCCR, what it is all about, namely Engineering Life, and why you, about five years ago, uh, started with a team of uh, colleagues to, uh, to work on this project. I need a little bit longer to think about this question because mm -hmm. we didn't discuss about it. <laughs> this morning, <laughs> what we did this morning discussed about how beautiful it is in Ticino, <laughs> how wonderful life is. In yeah. We had a really enjoyful e e morning <laughs> and we didn't discuss any questions. So now I have to think. And uh, I just tell you the history how everything came. And I came to the, I've been now in Switzerland almost 20 years, but I've been away for 10 years in between. And these 10 years I left Basel University, and I left my discipline because at that time I did work with single molecules. This is so, so tiny. I was, we are consisting of cells. Our body is t held together by cells, by living cells. And these cells have, every cell has about one billion, one billion, one billion, not one million, one billion machines inside. And they all work. It's like New York times the factor 100. So imagine New York of one billion inhabitants. And a cell, when we have one billion cells, and one cell of our body has one billion inhabitants. And they all work. We have our uh, bakery, like baking bread, making energy for the cell that the cell can survive. These are the mitochondria. These are the bakery houses. Some have very good bread. Some other ones have very bad bread. 
We have other, other, other proteins or machines which transport, like we have in our cells, we have highways, we have other like uh, post offices which bring to the cargo, which has to be transported in the cell, a stamp so that the taxi driver in the cell knows, okay, this has to go to this area or this area in the cell. And this, now I told you about only three different professions in the cell, but we have more than one million. So we have one million different machines in the cell and they're highly qualified and, uh, and, and specified and they have been specified let's say in the last 10 million or 100 million years of the world. So there's at, the, at the beginning possibly we had one chemical molecule and then it become more complex and then we had a simple form of, of living which had a possibly consisted of one, 100 or 1,000 different machines and now we humans have more than millions different machines in our body working. Now, if you come from a biophysics, you see these machines, and this is what I did in the Biocenter Basel. I worked on one machine, one of one out of one billion we have in our cell, and I found it most fascinating because I could try to understand how such a machine works. But at some point, I asked, "Wait a minute! I want to understand how such a machine works in a body." Now, our body has hun one billion cells, and each cell has one billion machines. This is an incredible high number of machines we have in our body. They all work at this point. Now that you can see me, these are machines which are called rhodopsins. They catch this light, you trans the light is transferred into electrical signal and then processed in the brain and the brain reconstructs that you can see me. And already I will tell you later that if we take such a machine, this is the machine here in the corner, this is rhodopsin, and uh, if the rhodopsin does not work, you get blind, you lose vision. And now we learned that there are many other organisms in the world which, which produce a rhodopsin which is actually better suitable to restore vision. So we take these machines and then we from uh, algae and put them back into the eye to restore vision. And this is works now in the clinical phase, so it's now it, it works on. Sorry for that. We have to do animal uh, um, experiments first. First, you work with uh, um, um, uh, mi mice, then you work with pork, and then you work with apes. And now, finally, we allow to go to humans, to blind humans, that we take this rhodopsin from a different organism and put it in the eye of the blind people and these people can see again. And this is a viral treatment. So we have, and this is an incredible what we do. We engineer viruses. We have, the people set up, scientists set up now factories to produce viruses, to engineer viruses, not to make you sick, but these viruses bring into the cell a new information and they reprogram the cell and they bring in the, the rhodopsin of your eye to restore vision. And uh, that's exciting if you have somebody who lost vision and suddenly this person can see again. At the moment, it's they only can see black and white, but now we want the next step in 10 years to get full color vision back to the people. So this is what we are working on. This is a fascination and this is emotions. Mm -hmm. This is an old topic in, in ethics or in religion. You know when blind people got uh, their vision back by, I think it was, Petrus or Jesus, you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and now suddenly you can experience, we, we are not Petrus or, or, or Jesus, I'm not saying that, but we are just pure technocrats. We think there is a possibility that we bring vision back. But we do it in many other diseases. And this was only one machine of one billion. What happens if, if it, does, it doesn't work, you lose blindness. There are other machines, you get diabetes, other ones you can get cancer. And we, one after the other, we develop technologies to bring them back into the body. The advantage is you don't need drugs, but we go into your body and we change the genome. And the genome is your identity. The genome, what is programmed in your gene, in your chromosomes, is you. And it's everything of your history of the back. It's your grandparents, grand -grand grandparents, and whatever goes back hundred thousands of years. And we go in and we change it. And we change your identity. Now, should I stop? 
Well, I'm um, talking too much. Eh? Very fascinating, but I'm <laughs> not that. going to tell you whether it was Jesus or Peter. So that's <laughs> something for you to find out. Uh, you have brought uh, three more slides, and maybe we can briefly uh, go th uh, through okay. them. Um, since we are talking about the, the therapeutical um, aspects of this okay. research, you know, we have 100 scientists in this NCCR uh, spread all over the, uh, uh, the country involved, and so there are many different aspects. So this is now. And this is now just how we, Barbara will take you on a journey you won't believe because it's really about, she will grow, take your skin cell and grow hundred of your eyes or brains or livers. It's scary what they can do, it's but fantastic if you're sick. Now what we, our conceptualization is, it's a completely new engineering which has been developed here in Switzerland. Switzerland is pioneering worldwide here. And the ETH is traditionally an engineering uh, university and uh, started possibly with, with, uh, with the Gotthard, but now the engineering is completely different. We see machines like these molecular, these machines which have been produced by, uh, by, by, by evolution, this one billion different. We, we, on the left side, this, these are two different machines. One is purely biological, the other one is synthetic, so we make some we modify the biological molecule in your body, we make it semi-biological, so it's some chemical modification. We bring a few machines of them together into a system. So for example, machine one works together with machine two to produce a complex product, and then we build factories. So we can make, we have one billion machines out of the humans and many, many more out of plants and bacteria, and we bring them together to make a factory. Uh, we can produce some chemicals, we can remove some waste products, you can clean water, you can even use these factories to convert energy into a uh, light energy into uh, um, uh, like a solar module. What you can do go also into the animal and, and to, to uh, guide, um, um, uh, to restore function, for example. And what we are doing is oncology, we do diabetes, and we do vision restoration at three topics because we are only 30 uh, research groups which are about 250 people. You can't do more seriously. You would need additional center to, d to address other diseases which we are planning now, but that's the beginning. Now, is there another slide? Yeah. Oh yeah, and here you see how such a cell, this is a biological cell, this is a front cover of a, of a scientific journal. It's like Vogue, if you are in a, an actor, you want to be in Vogue, our cells, we put, we're very, this drum, we put our cells under the front cover, not our cells. <laughs> and you see just an illustration how such a cell is rewired and, and reprogrammed. It's very simplified. And on the right one you see what we also do is we go for neuronal disorders, we go into the brain and then we, we um, 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 bring control elements into neurons to, uh, to um, fight diseases like neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. And this is just what we uh, I try to explain you, that one thing what we are doing is very popular at the moment is because it's going clinical phase, or in clinics now, it's, it's re vision restoration for blind people. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so far. Um, Barbara Treutlein is professor of quantitative developmental biology, also working at the ETH Zürich, BBSSE. They have a satellite building department in Basel. And so the ETH Zürich and the University of Basel are both directing this NCCR project. Barbara, da Daniel already mentioned it, you are working uh, with cells. As a matter of fact, you told me once uh, you try to understand cells and how they make decisions. Tell us more about it. Yes, so I, actually my background is very similar to, to Daniel's. I also used to look at individual molecules, but I, I very fast realized I want to go to, to, to cells and to, to even tissues and understand how, how we humans develop and how our organs develop, because it's just an extremely fascinating process where originally there's one cell, and then we end up with this complex body with all these different tissues, organs with extremely different functions. And um, so these billion cells that uh, Daniel talks about, uh, they are all very different and have their very specific function. And so what we are interested in is how the cells 
come to acquire these different functions if they started all as one individual cell. Um, <coughs> and so we nowadays have actually extremely uh, high throughput, fancy technology to analyze the cells of our body, which, which means you take the individual cells and you measure all the genes that are being expressed in that cell. So, so what parts of the genome are used in every individual cell and that allows us to say, oh, this is a liver cell that currently um, is functioning in this way, metabolic way. Oh, this is a, a, a nerve cell. Uh, this is a, an, another cell in the brain and so on. So we can very well classify the cells. And so what we now do is um, to, to use these new technologies to classify cells during development, trying to describe how and, and, and trying to find out how cells that are initially very similar can go on different paths and have very different specific functions. And so how can we actually learn something about human development? I mean, it is ethically extremely uh, questionable. We don't want to go in and study human embryos. I mean, this is something that uh, yeah, the, uh, clearly there are problems with that. But this is where the current advances in, bi in the biomedical research come in that are extremely uh, fascinating and exciting to us where um, maybe we can go to, to the next slide where um, we can actually nowadays, and I'm sure you've heard about it, but we can take really a cell of your body. It can be a skin cell. It can also just be plugging a hair and taking the keratinocytes that are at the hair uh, follicle. So it's very little intervention, getting some cells of your body, and then we can um, reprogram these cells into pluripotent stem cells. And these pluripotent stem cells are cells very similar to embryonic cells. They have the capacity to, to become any other cell of your body. So we can take this cell that is very specified, a skin cell or on in, in a hair follicle cell and make it, bring it all the way back to an embryonic cell. And then this embryonic cell, and this is now happening in the dish, so you don't know anything, uh, you know, you don't feel it, uh, you just gave a hair plug or a, a small skin biopsy. And this, these cells are then capable of making a liver cell, hepatocyte for example, or a cardiomyocyte, a, a heart muscle cell or even a neuron, a, a, a cell um, of, of your brain. And um, so this is one thing, but uh, what is even more fascinating to us, and this is where we really um, do our work right now, is that you can take these pluripotent ce uh, cells, these, these embryonic-like cells that you generate from a, an adult human, you can form little balls of tissue of these cells when they are still very unspecified. And then over many, many tens and hundreds of years of research, we, found, uh, we, we have found out, for example, studying the fruit fly or mice, what signal cells get when they turn from this pluripotent cell into a heart cell, let's say. And so we can, this little ball of tissue, we can give them the signals, and then this ball of tissue turns into actually heart tissue. And, and this is something that re recently was I realized. I, I, <laughs> I just bring it down to a very simple level. Imagine what she explains to you on a, on a little bit higher scientific level now, and it gets complex. They, they Barbara takes your skin, takes a little bit skin out. It's about a millimeter of your skin, not a millimeter. You don't even feel it. It's like this flat, not more. And these cells, you, she will reset. It's like in a computer at home, you think, oh, this doesn't work, I have to reset. You restart. And they restart, and then these cells, she can reprogram that they will grow a mini liver, a mini brain, some eyes, some muscle cells, some bones. And she can do it 100 brains of your cells, or 100 eyes, and they're working. These are mini eyes, they watch you, and they can work. <laughs> and uh, now they stop it. At the moment, they are stopping it, but some people don't stop it. And you may have read in the ZZ last uh, week about the chimera, that they take these organs into a bigger animal and they let them grow in. 
that you have a liver grown into a pork, into a pig, and this liver then will, can you, you take, if you have liver cancer, to replace your liver, or to re replace uh, a part of your muscle, or bone, or whatever. So now if you are sick, and this is, this is changing how we, it's also changing the identity, and now I give you back. You are sick, <laughs> you have liver cancer, for example, or skin cancer. Barbara comes, takes your cell, or her team, takes your cell, and they grow a new liver out of it. Right? And more, they go into the cell, correct everything which has been wrong in the cell, because you have re liver, and removes it, so you have a perfect liver. But this correction is not necessarily what is your com from your body, but it was wrong. She takes it from a different body or different organism. But it takes back into your body and then you're corrected. Now think about your identity, what this means. And I give it back to Barbara, because now she will take <laughs> every one of you a little bit skin, and in a few days you will have your eyes watching <laughs> you from the outside. Barbara, you brought some pictures yes, and slides I, I wanted so we to can just get show an you. idea. Thank you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speeding up, uh, but this just should give you a, a few impressions, three different uh, slides. Here is, for example, a liver organoid, so we call these mini organs organoids. Um, this is a li little uh, liver organoid, and um, yeah, you can, ju can just see on the right, if, if you can see that, they, they really have quite some complexity already, and this is in vitro. You can grow them with a vasculature, you have uh, liver cells, the hepatocytes in there, you have a vasculature. Um, so this is highly fascinating. Maybe if you go to the next, where we have a um, heart organoid, which um, actually original wa was a movie, it doesn't play now, but what you need to imagine is that on the right, this sphere is actually beating. So these are cardiomyocytes that develop from these pluripotent cells, and they start a uh, very coordinated beating which is just extremely fascinating to me that that can happen in vitro with this uh, process. And then the last one, and this is something that we are very actively doing, is growing uh, brain organoids. And so um, this is, uh, I mean, just so you have an idea, these are little tissues that are a uh, size of uh, a few millimeters. So this is not growing a, a huge tissue. Uh, it is very small at this point. But you have different regions um, that resemble different brain regions, and we have many different brain regions with different functions. And in those regions, we have, we can generate neurons of different identities. And so this very much resembles the architecture of a human brain in a very small, in a very small format. But uh, what we can do and what we are doing is then generating these also from patients that have maybe some uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, mm -hmm. and then we can actually learn how does how, does, how do these disorders come about? And what we can, of course, then do is we can come with a whole battery of, of drugs and from this one individual patient grow yeah, hundreds, hundreds of mini brains, apply the drugs in a high throughput way and find out which drug would maybe help the most um, to, to uh, restore a function of the cells, of neuronal cells, of, of, of the hepatocytes in the liver and so on. And then go very precisely with this drug back to the patient um, and, and have a very efficient personalized treatment. And this is something that uh, is happening right now. This is what people are doing the same for cancer, uh, as, as Daniel mentioned. And um, yeah, this Barbara, is- you, you talked about these uh, cells, the t human tissue you're using. Where exactly do you get it from? And what happens with the material once you have used it and don't use it anymore? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the the cells, the, the initial skin or, or hair follicle cells we obtain from patients. And of course these patients have to consent, they have to agree that we use them and they have to be informed what we would do with the cells. And so the, the patients have to be informed and sign this consent form um, and then we can, only then we can obtain the cells. Um, and so the patients know what we do with it and they have to agree or not that we go, um, what kind of data could eventually also for us as scientists, we want to publish research that we do, whether we can publish it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and currently when we grow these uh, mini organs, at the end of our experiments, we are just uh, wasting them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, yeah, this is, this is what is being done. I have to say that currently the, the maturation of these tissues is still a bit a problem, um, but the field is developing so quickly that very soon I'm, I'm sure we have quite mature organs in the dish. And then at some point there, of course, comes the question, you grow a mini brain, is this brain conscious? Can you, who, whose brain is this? The scientist or the, the, the person that gave the cells? Um, and what do you do with it? Can you really just trash it at the end of your experiment? And so this is, these are questions, and this is also why we are here. We want the public to know, and I think a discourse has to start with the public, with, with peop policy people, um, ethicists, um, to find out what are the limitations of our research and where do we need reg new regulations, because this is such a new research that is happening right now. So even legal entities are not prepared yet. Uh, what can we do and what not? Yeah, I guess the, the question about identity and ownership, very important ethical questions. And as you said, this is why we take these questions uh, to places like Locarno and uh, inform about it. And, and not all these questions have answers yet. And they needed to be answered or they need to be answered uh, by the public on, 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 on grow. Um, so, Daniel, you uh, talked about the question of, of uh, identity uh, a little uh, earlier, and that raises the question, as a matter of fact, uh, what, what does it do to human identity, to a person's uh, identity, to the concept of personhood, when we are able to take a cell and grow a new brain, for example? Um, that is a very scary, strange thought, actually, even though it's reality. I mean, you can go into her lab, into Barbara's lab, as I did a l couple of weeks ago, and say hello to <laughs> all kinds of organs there. It's a very strange experience. It really is. Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had, I d it's difficult even for us to approach this problem, and I, I try to give you two analogies. Uh, analogies analogs to help you going this way. One is, uh, we had a joke yesterday, and it's a weird joke, like you sometimes you have some cartoons of scientists sitting together, and then they, ha, then they have a good idea, and, or a weird idea, and they, they laugh about it just to get some distance and go closer and to go from different perspectives. Imagine now Barbara takes my skin and she grows 20 brains. She doesn't stop them, they get big. They get eyes, they can see, it's really true, they can see. And they're only in the culture dish. And, uh, and I'm a lazy man, and I, I would like to go more to Ticino and to holidays, and somebody has a question, has a question, and I say, nah, I'm in holidays, but brain number five is responsible for this question, he will give you the answer. Or if you want to have a more administrative uh, question, then please go to brain number 10 or 12. They are good in answering this question. So you delegate. It's not so far now that it will go like that. But, well, well it's, it's a little bit far-stretched. But in principle, I could do also something, and this will come, I'm pretty sure, in China. But we as Swiss, we have to think whether we want to go this way. You take, a, again, the skin cell, Barbara, or, I t or somebody else. It must not be always Barbara, right? <laughs> And uh, in, we, in a few years, I think at the moment, what Barbara indicated is that these organoids will be stopped growing. But in principle, you can also let them grow in into embryos. So I could grow from my skin, I could grow 10 embryos in principle. And uh, the question is, do they belong to me? At one point, are they now independent or not? Another thing is, I will come then and edit these uh, embryos to get out the wrong genes, to correct, to make it better in vision, to make it better in you will not have diabetes, the Alzheimer genes will be removed or something like that. These clones will be better than yours. And uh, now you can think from different perspectives. The first perspective I had, they will be identical to I, ha I am, possibly even better, but they will not be have the same personality because what, what I have is my personality, what makes myself is everything what I experience. And the experience is what I experience everyday life, whether it's here in Locarno or the holidays I have or the work I have. 
this makes my own the friends and the family, whatever I have been exposed in life. And that makes my identity. It must, our thinking will be different about identity, particularly because, now I stop. Or should I come with the disease identity about the ethics? Well, um, what, what I think um, yeah. is, is um, in important uh, in this context is th that right now it appears that the vast majority of decisions in this process of, of editing the genome, for example, is being taken by natural scientists. And this is a group within society. It's a small group. It's an elite group, you may say, an, an internationally connected group. But these are decisions that are so wide-reaching. I mean, they, they interfere with the biography of future generations. Uh, don't you, as natural scientists, see the need uh, to broaden up that discussion and, and this process of decision making because this group is too small in my mind to make these vast mistakes. Yes, I mean, um, the, the decision about whether or not scientists can do that definitely has to be a common decision mm -hmm. of the public and the scientists and, and other entities. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, yeah, one thing is growing your own your own mini brain. Currently, it doesn't mature very well. Even if you grow it for years, it won't become a, a, a brain that resembles a, a two, three, four-year-old uh, brain because, of course, it, it lacks the other organs. But it's, it's very close that one can connect the brain organoid to other organoids and try to make a, a whole uh, network of organs. Or, as, as Daniel mentioned, you can take these pluripotent cells and actually drive them along the embryonic path and try to create everything within one tissue. And this is where you have then an embryoid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where uh, even more there are uh, questions of whether you should do that and how far you can do that. And, and currently, I think th the scientists doing this kind of research um, consider their tissues they grow um, similar to, to, to human embryos that could grow out of a, a, a fertilized egg that, for example, is a byproduct of some in vitro fertilizations. And currently the rule is after day 14, you cannot do anything w mm -hmm. anymore with these tissues. And yeah, that will be the question. Is, mm -hmm. is this similar for these uh, tissues that you grow from an original skin cell? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they have similar characteristics. Mm -hmm. Fr first I must say, you know, it's not like that we, that we say, okay, we are scientists and, and now you help us. What we, but what, what these, these, these treatments will approach society already and are already in the society. You may have read it about the treatments which cost between 300 and 6,000 Swiss francs for one treatment to, res to prevent from blindness. It's liver agorosis. It's uh, sold by, uh, I think, Roche, and another one is by Novartis, is uh, by, uh, it's a mu muscle arth atrophy. These are the two first gene-based therapies. The pharma companies invested more than 10 billion Swiss francs in the last year, not year, only one year, to build up this technology. And it's increasing. There's, there's more and more coming that the, the you will get. And these diseases, uh, these treatments are genome editing diseases, uh, treatments. So they go already into your body. They already do it. We know what will come next. It will get much more complex. It will not be only one gene brought or corrected into a body. There will be new sensing pathways. We will sense new parameters of the environment. And uh, this will be then uh, uh, processed in your cells, in your body, to produce the correct reaction in terms of diabetes, for example, or other diseases. It will come. And the society has to prepare to say, moment, we just don't want to be passive and let these treatments approaching us. Now is the time that we have to get active and we have to understand what these scientists are doing and many more and also pharma is doing and how these treatments will affect us. And of course, as you mentioned, those are quite expensive treatments, so they are not necessarily uh, available for everyone in the society. So mm -hmm. It, it increases... Uh, question of justice. Right? Yes, que no. question of justice. Who can have uh, a, 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 the biomedical people make organoids from you and, and mm -hmm. really uh, make this personalized treatment 
or who can get the genes repaired in the eye to, to uh, resolve the blindness and so on, and who cannot. And, and this, of course, uh, creates problems in the society. Mm -hmm. So it's not also the question, to whom will you invest 300 or 600,000 to uh, restore bl blindness? That's the current cost of it. So possibly not anymore for all people, but on or if you're a very rich society, also for all people, but mainly for young people, because I think they, ha they can still produce or contribute for 50 years or 60 years to, so to the society. So it's investment as a society in somebody who contributes into society, which is normally how you think. But other parts of the, of the world cannot even afford it. So we can, and another thing is that if you, these, these diseases can, uh, these treatments can be also used to clean up your germline. So for example, germline is the, the genetic information I have in my body and every one of us has mistakes. And some mistakes, they enhance the probability that you get diseases. So if you could clean up your germ germline that this probability goes very, very low that you get diseases. Would you do it for you and your kids, everyone? So and which, which, I mean, what, uh, what mutations should be is it, is it should be corrected, right? Exactly. Which mutations, and is it then a lifestyle product, and who can afford it? So there will be a, the society will go may go in the different uh, direction. Let's That's perhaps also. briefly discuss the time frame, uh, especially uh, looking at, at this NCCR. Yeah. What, what, how many years will it take to? Uh, to come up with practical or medical application, what do you envision right now? Is it five years, 10 years, 20 years? Well, the, the first two, as I said, are already on the market, and I'm pretty sure there are next one lined up to come from pharma. We are having now three uh, clinical phases in the NCCR. One is uh, regenerative surgery. So for example, if you had lost a part of your tissue, it will be uh, regrown and then implanted again. Uh, and the other one is vision restoration, and the third one is diabetes control. Vision restoration might come in three to five years, mm -hmm. and regenerative surgery is even more advanced. It might be in three years, diabetes control in 10 years. And Barbara? Uh, yeah, for the, for the in vitro grown organs, uh, I mean, the, the screening drugs uh, of in vitro for in vitro organs, this is happening now, uh, and will for sure be even way more happening in the next uh, five years, mm -hmm. five to 10 years. The, the use of these in vitro grown organs to transplant, so I grow your liver in vitro and then transplant it back, this is uh, further I in the future. I, I would imagine that it's for sure five to 10 years in the future because currently these, these organs you grow in the dish are not yet like the organ you have in your body and you have to really be careful that you don't transplant something that, that could go wrong then and actually generate cancer. So, so these are things that need to be uh, strictly uh, monitored and the clinical trials will be starting, but of course this all always takes time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but using, using the, these mini organs to identify personalized treatments in cancer, in, in, in metabolic diseases, this is happening right now, yeah. So. I think what is very important is that we are here to approach society. I think we want to give this topic into society because I think that the society has to decide, not we as uh, scientists, not uh, industry has to decide whether this comes. We as a society have to say what is good for us, what is not good. And therefore, mm -hmm. Rome, you will talk about Rome or yeah. not? Briefly. Mm -hmm. You will do it? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. then. So we approach even a bigger society in soon. In next now, time. in this research, um, a lot of machine uh, metaphors have been introduced from the very beginning. And I wonder why. Is it, why is it necessary to talk about factories, uh, about machines, about reactors, when we talk about uh, human curation, human disease, human beings, and identity? To me, this really creates at least uh, more distance to the public than, than getting them in the boat. And it also has a little scary touch to me, sound. Why do we need that mm. machine me metaphor well, language? Well, it's an analogy because if I talk about proteins, people will not understand. And, and prote if I talk, prote proteins are the machines of our body. And normally if I talk about proteins, people think it's something to eat. <laughs> and it's true because <laughs> mainly <laughs> you teach this way. So a machine is just uh, uh, like a 
not a tool which we have developed in the body to do certain work. And uh, mm -hmm. so we have this technological language. I guess the idea is this yeah. is what people work with every day and maybe mm -hmm. uh, it mm -hmm. is closer to them than some biological uh, yeah. but uh, vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But of course, this is all organic <laughs> material yeah. um, that we, yeah. So we take it out of a context of a living system and put it into a new living system, like from a bacteria or algae into humans, or you can take it from another human into another human, that the machines work there. And then you bring the machines or the proteins together into new networks, they are regulated. So it's not that they are just working like a, a car, you give fuel and it works. They're regulated, they see, they, there's a sensing system if they work too much or they work not enough. They, they turn, they're tuned down or tuned up or t switched off. So it gets more and more complicated. It's like um, um, bringing new s uh, regulation systems into your organ, for example, so that the liver will be regulated differently or the brain or the eye. We've scratched the surface of this uh, huge uh, scientific field, um, but Daniel mentioned Rome and there's one picture we're going to show towards the end before we open um, the discussion. Uh, we invite you and uh, scientists and artists, the young scientists, um, theologians, uh, religious leaders to Rome next year. This NCCR, Molecular Systems Engineering, together with Bambino Gesù, which is a, the largest uh, children's hospital in, in Europe, actually, with its base in Rome. And also people from the Vatican and from other religions we invite uh, to a conference. It's going to be the first international conference of this kind on the ethical challenges of this scientific field. So you hopefully see that we are serious about this discussion and we are still insecure. You might notice this here and there when discussing and when talking about it, but hopefully you will help us now uh, in this uh, discussion. I think it's time to open up for some questions. There's a lady here in the first row. We could have the microphone uh, here. And while it gets here, let me also uh, inform you, we have some young researchers, PhD students here with us who are attending the base camp in the festival. Towards the end of this talk, they are going to hand out, we have about 100 copies of this arts uh, catalog. There's an, 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 an artist, Maria Pomianski, who we had invited into our labs for a couple of weeks. It just got printed, it's a limited edition, and she just uh, painted the way she thinks we, we work. And uh, so there are lab paintings and office paintings and so on. Some information on this NCCR, so you are free to uh, get your copy. Hopefully we have enough. And here's the first question of this uh, lady, please. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's, it's very exciting, everything. <laughs> I'm very happy to get this information firsthand. And um, of course, I welcome the chance of having the dialogue uh, with, with society and, and science. Now, I think it's completely clear that the technology is exciting and it's a no-brainer what the benefits, the potential benefits are. So I'm not going to talk about that, <laughs> that, which would be the fun part. Mm -hmm. um, as with all new technologies, I guess there are two major questions that are raised. And the first is the question of abuse. So if you can use viruses to introduce sight, you can also use viruses to introduce blindness, obviously. So that's one field I assume you as ethicists need to deal with this question, so we as society. And then the second one is something we've talked about briefly is the costs and who can afford it and the question of equality in society. And so the question basically is how does society deal with new technology, with emerging technologies? And I'm very pessimistic, <laughs> unfortunately, because I don't see any so nice answers or solutions. We have several other instances where it does not work so it is like opening the box of Pandora with CRISPR. We don't have a solution. I hope you too, for you too, you don't have the same um, shiksal of, or as um, the mother of CRISPR has, who's barely doing any more research and is only dealing with governance, information, um, 
all these issues, trying to somehow contain the results and deal with it. And I also think that I understand it when we say we need to open the discussion and have society answer, but society doesn't have the answers for the questions you're, you're raising. Yeah, a lot of very important questions. Maybe we start with the, the question about uh, security issues like dual use, for example. Uh, we know that there are always two sides to the coin of our scientific research. And just to give you an example, da Daniel briefly mentioned the Chimere issue. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was reported, you might have read it in the newspapers, that the Japanese government allowed uh, to create uh, mouse human chi uh, chimeras, which is only like four, four weeks ago. Ten days ago, I read in the paper that researchers from Salk Institute in the United States reprogrammed human cells before injecting them in the monkey embryo. And they did this in China to uh, avoid legal issues. So, I mean, that's, that's an open secret. We know uh, our way around. How are we going to regulate? Is it, is it possible to, to regulate uh, this, this huge uh, research uh, that is a uh, result that is coming up now in these days? Yeah, I mean, there are countries that are very restrictive. There are countries that are very permissive. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I'm sure you all heard about the CRISPR babies where actually CRISPR engineering, so genome engineering was done in human embryos and then uh, they were carried out and, and now there are these uh, twin twins that were born. And um, this actually led to st more strict regulations in China. This is what, what, uh, what I read, but uh, I think yeah, it is hard s for the whole world to have to have the same ethical standard, and of course, this, so for the stem cell research, there is the International Society for Stem Cell Research, the ISSCR, that has regulations, and we all try to um, uh, stick to these regulations, which would not allow this uh, CRISPR editing on 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 a human embryo. And uh, but of course, there will always be some that don't stick to the rules. Um, I mean, in this case, I think it led to stricter regulations in China, but uh, I, I know this, uh, that there will always be these problems. And it is still, you are right, CRISPR editing, there are a lot of off-targets that we don't know about. Uh, so to, to bring this into, um, to, to, to use it to really change the genome of a, of a not yet born baby that, that we have no idea what effect it will have on the, on the on this individual, and uh, this and just something that we yeah. cannot do because we don't know that that person might then not have this early disease, uh, but have s might suffer way more at the end. We, so uh, it's just not responsible to do something like that, I think. And um, so, so yeah, definitely, uh, we use CRISPR more in order to find out what genes are doing to learn more about gene function. Um, one could say in the retina, uh, th th this is a very um, separated organ, and you are doing this to the adult patient to restore vision. Uh, there, it's more the problem of, of uh, what is, uh, you know, only a few percentage of the society will have access to it. But um, yeah, I think it's clear in the in that that uh, editing, c uh, genome editing in in embryos is uh, should not be allowed, and and I think. The vast majority of scientists uh, has the same idea about that. Daniel? Um. Daniel? Uh, some, it's a rather complex question. I think we have to get into the discourse that the, in, in a, a society. And a society uh, has uh, to learn, must learn to understand. And the danger is, of course, with viruses you can misuse, but you can misuse, they are much more toxic substances than viruses and they're already existing in the world and luckily they have not spread very often to humanity if you don't look to Syria or something like that. And I hope that this will also not happen with virus, but it gives another not chance to harm if you want to harm. But there are already har viruses out there which are much more harmful than we can possibly engineer. It's like the Ebola or, or something like that. But what we try to do in Rome, and I have to s say I would like to uh, add on to Ralph's 
description, we approached the Vatican to do this conference because we thought, okay, we have to approach a society, a big society. And the Vatican has one billion members. That was big enough for us. But th and then we came up with the idea and we said, okay, we go to this conference, but only if we also invite Muslims, we if we invite, and also representative of the Muslim relig uh, of the religion, also of Jews, and also I think Hinduism, so but Buddhists, at least four world religions. And also we invite, well, we pa participants will be the historians, will be ethicists, will be um, um, to talk about these issues so that we learn or everyone learns from uh, different sides. And for our, from our point, there is no prejustice. We just want to bring it out and hear what is the fear and what is, what is uh, we, we, there we have to know what is the regulation and not just continue like that and do what we want and be happy that there is none because it's, or n there are some, but there are, I think we need new ones and also we need to n a new, new approaches of understanding. If and I what is very important, what we, what we say is mostly approachable for young people. So in the conference that we will have is people from uh, below 25 from all over the world, they will be invited. From so, so I wanted to add one thing. I have pessimistic moments for sure. Um, f to me, this is similar to thinking about social media. I don't, in principle, don't like social media. So, uh, uh, but somehow one cannot close their eyes from it. And so uh, this is happening. So one can, won't, prevent it from happening and I think mm. that's why there needs to be discussion understanding different uh, parties and then trying to set regulations in, in, in place. It is also, I mean, one could say we don't allow any stem cell research um, and, and maybe all the countries would get together and decide that. But this is to me also unethical because um, the, the opportunities we have to find a specified treatment for an individual person um, instead of uh, doing a lot of mouse research uh, and at the end finding a drug that works in the mouse and finding out that that doesn't work in humans because the, the mouse brain or the mouse, uh, all the mouse organs are very different from ours. So I think it's also unethical to fully uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, prevent that. So um, I think it's, it is developing in that direction and, and one can be pessimistic about it, but we need uh, regulations and we need a discussion because it will happen. Uh, it doesn't matter if I say I give up, I don't do it anymore. It will still happen. Yeah. One more question there. I, okay. I would have a question <laughs> when it comes to regulation. Um, who, who should be responsible for develop regulations? I mean, Formally, you know, normal governmental mechanisms are in place, but are they ready to do that also regulation in your field? Or um, is there a need for a big international, completely new mechanism structure for regulations? I mean, mm. who should do that? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and, and uh, really international regulatory entities are being established, yes. So just like I mentioned, the uh, International Society for Stem Cell Re Research, which is uh, across the world, uh, stem cell researchers are part of this. Um, th we have the discussions within this society and, and, and then there are, with big projects, uh, the Brain Initiative in the US, in, in Europe, they realize that, that there are, there's a need for ethical regulations and, and this is where then the establishment of such um, uh, entities happens. So I think we are on a good way to have international um, regulations, which is needed because, uh, but of course every country has their own rules. So it is sometimes hard to, uh, uh, to, to bring them together. Time for two more questions, I think. This gentleman here, please. Organoids uh, for dictators, uh, that's a bad vision, definitely. But there is a, there are good visions, too. I mean, if you look at humankind and the uh, arms raised to the bottom, could you reprogram uh, us to get rid of too egoistic or too... <laughs> ma I mean, there is a huge positive uh, uh, possibilities in that. 
I think we one could, but I think it's it's better to uh, uh, to educate society to make put more into education because I think there should be still the free will <laughs> and not a reprogramming from a weird scientist because it can go in the other way in one other way. But you can also be reprogrammed by press or whatever you know if you see it if you if you see it in a strict. In a, in a strict way. So uh, the first thing is uh, that we take consequences of what we learn mm -hmm. in the environment. And whether you become vegan or whether you uh, change your life differently to respect environment and respect other living organisms, that's up to you. And I think we have to learn to, to, to take the right steps from what we already know. Yeah, so I you're sure yeah. that uh, there is the free will of things? Um, in our society it is, more or less. Yeah. I would yeah. say we need to prevent that from happening, actually, because it's unclear who would decide what can you try to get rid of. Absolutely. Like which disorder, which uh, intellectual uh, level, which size, body size, which, I mean, that, yeah. that is just, we don't want to go there. Last I question, <laughs> the gentleman here in the first row, and then uh, feel free to ask us following this um, so talk. I mean, we're all a big believer in the in enlightenment and free will, etc. But you know, when I look at these hearings, for example, Mark Zuckerberg with the American Congress, and I, I really ask myself, who's qualified to, you know, to, to, to actually regulate this sort of thing? And you know, we've had these discussions around climate change, where even you know, 80% of the academics agree, or 95% of the academics agree, but still, you know, yeah. so, so it, it's very, I, I, I'm also very optimistic like you, but you know, as things become much more complex, you know, who's really qualified to, to regulate these things? And should we maybe be thinking about self-regulation or the social norms around the, the expert groups? I, I don't know what the solution is, but mm. I'm quite skeptical of a, a congressman in Louisiana being able to, to judge on but the merits of AI <laughs> or exactly. you know, to what extent all these algorithms are, are seeking our attention and, and determining what we want to see in Netflix before we even know, et cetera. So sorry to be devil's advocate, but I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that. Brief answer. How could that, how could that happen? Who could regulate? Uh, I must say I'm happy to live here in Europe and not in Louisiana because mm -hmm. but, but it's shocking if you think that way. It's frustrating. I, I fully believe, and I don't have the, I don't have a solution to to something like that. It's what I think is here, and particularly in Switzerland, we have a very open democratic way to think about it and to decide about it and to and to go to in the, in the, into a discourse. And at the end, the society will also be have the possibility to vote about it. It's and and that's a that's absolutely, absolutely. And microphone we, we need to use the microphone okay how, how do you want to do it you know but I, that's the op that's for me the optimistic so my, way my, my yeah. comment was yeah. that switzerland completely missed i mean they're leading the world in chemistry and, and pharmaceuticals but they completely missed the biotechnology movement because you know they they put it to a vote and these sort of very innocent ignorant people voted against the development of biotechnology and and that's the truth. So it, it, that's an act, it, it, it's actually an example mm. of precisely what I'm saying. And I don't yeah. think it's Louis yeah. you know, that's Basel. That's not Louisiana. Yeah. Mm. But I think it's uh, it's it has to be a, gr uh, a bigger group of people that are experts in in, in different uh, areas that that has to de it cannot be one person deciding. Uh, it, it I think it should also not be mm. a vote of the society deciding because they we, we saw what can happen with Brexit and I mean there needs to be a lot of information in every person's head to make a decision. Okay, we'll it's a little difficult without the microphone <laughs> and I know that now we start to get going. Um, let's close officially here and then continue the discussion uh, in the cafe. I would really like to thank uh, Barbara Treutlein yeah. and uh, Daniel Müller for being here. Thank you all uh, for your interest and hopefully this is uh, the beginning of a discussion, not only today but in the future. Feel free to pick up a copy of our little art sketchbook from the NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering and uh, enjoy this wonderful, this great and fantastic festival. Thank you for having me. <laughs>